You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello and welcome to another US-China trade war podcast in exile here from the burbs of Hong Kong. I am Finbar Birmingham on the political economy desk here at the South China Morning Post. But rather than our usual newsroom studio, we are all cooped up in our apartments with Hong Kong fully in working from home mode. The novel coronavirus has been spreading at a rampant rate through China and this week cases ratcheted up in Hong Kong too. The ongoing story has gotten very local with the declaration of a community-based outbreak in Hong Kong. We are fully masked and sanitized, ready to discuss the economic fallout from this quickly worsening situation. There has been some really significant news today in tariffs we're recording on Thursday and I will be talking about this with political economy editor Zhou Xin. However, there's really only one place to start. China is still on lockdown. Hundreds of millions of people are unable to get to work. Factories are idling, roads are empty. It has been called the biggest experiment in working from home the world has ever seen. And Zhou Xin will talk us through the economics of this. And that's fine if you, like me, can work from a laptop. But you can't drive a truck from home, nor can you assemble an iPhone, or tool out a factory, or put soybeans in a mill. For trade, the impact is going to be enormous. And I'm joined by Renault Angeran, the founder of SoFeast, a Hong Kong Shenzhen company that works with manufacturers who make stuff in China. Renault is going to give us the inside line on what exactly happens when factories close their doors and shut off their production lines in the workshop of the world. So what happens next? Stay tuned to find out. Hello, Fingba. I am joined on the line by political economy editor Zhou Xin from his self-quarantine, semi-quarantine in Happy Valley region of Hong Kong. Zhou Xin, this week again we've had another really bad time of it in China with the coronavirus, which is also starting to reach us in Hong Kong. When we spoke last week, you were very concerned about the economic impact of this and we discussed how if it really continues to spread in the way that it was spreading, China will struggle to reach its target economic growth uh, for the year, but also its strategic aim of doubling the size of its economy from 2010's levels. Have you seen anything this week that makes you feel more optimistic or do you think that this thing is going to get worse and worse for the Chinese economy? Well, I think for the last week, the uncertainty for the Chinese economy has certainly increased because, as we can see, the government has failed uh, to control the outbreak or, you know, it is not a time to say that China has successfully uh, controlled the spread of the virus. So as we can see that, uh, you know, all the local authorities are escalating their countermeasures to control this uh, uh, coronavirus. And we can see, like, every day there are new, newly added thousands of people being confirmed or being affected with the virus. And, you know, there are new deaths. So this is a very, very uh, bad situation. From an uh, economic point of view, uh, as we can see in the last week, things looked already very bad. But, for uh, you know, for this week, it it's, uh, seems getting, getting worse. Because, like, we are seeing in Hangzhou, you know, the whole city has basically been uh, locked down. And people are told to staying at their home and not allowing to get out. Every community, every village in China basically now is uh, become a closed community now. And the economic activities have, has been minimized. And also, as we know, you know, the, the, the Chinese New Year holiday has been over. It's supposed to be the season of the hundreds of millions of migrant workers uh, and office workers going back to their office, going back to their factories. But we are not seeing that situation happening. Mm-hmm. And nobody knows when these factories will resume production. Nobody really knows when these uh, work from home arrangement will be over. It all depends on how the uh, situation evolves, right? But now we can say like, uh, yes, we can possibly, you know, everything's okay. We can go back to work by the end of February. Or if everything is fine, maybe, you know, the middle middle of March was really the last last, uh, deadline, you know, whatever happens, we will just restart production. But that's all completely, uh, uh, complete, Assumptions. So everything is still based upon how the uh, coronavirus uh, the outbreak is is developing, and 
the good thing is, uh, of course, uh, the, the most positive thing is that if we see like the newly added cases every day has been stabilized. For instance, if in Zhejiang, we see every day, we see 100 new cases. And maybe that's the best scenario we can expect. You know, some factories may, okay, may take the risk of uh, restarting the production. But if, if the, the, the numbers are accelerating growth, then certainly there will be not be uh, possible for most of the factories or uh, companies to resume operation. Yeah. And this, this, this impact would be huge because not every company is uh, stocking a lot of cash to survive several months of uh, uh, zero revenue yeah. model. You know, uh, I, I, I read a survey by uh, two leading schools, uh, Peking University and Tsinghua University today, and they say about two thirds of Chinese small companies can only have cash you know, ready for two months of operation. In other words, if, if the situation lasted for two months, two thirds of the Chinese small companies may find it difficult to survive. Yeah, and that's an interesting so, point, Joshin, the difficulties for these small companies in surviving, because even though employees aren't working, as I understand it, governments, uh, the government is uh, ensuring that they're being paid their wage, so the companies do have to pay their staff even though they're not working. So when we, we, we report and, 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 you know, our team reports a lot about zombie companies in China who are basically hanging on by the skin of their teeth, this is the kind of event that will send many of those companies over the edge, do you think? Well, I think certainly that's the case. And uh, A, for the general policy, is first, first of all, for the, for the government, they have to protect that, uh, for protect the workers, you know, uh, they have to have a kind of source of income. And of course, for the, for the companies, for the employers, they think it's a bad policy because they say, oh, you are, the, the, the government is organizing a party and it is the businesses that pays the bill. That is, it's unfair, you know, it's, it sh- the burden should be shared. But anyway, uh, you, you, you make a very good point. It's like many companies uh, in 2019, the economy is not uh, particularly good, are already struggling. So this could be the last straw to break the camel's back as, we, as the saying goes, you know, many companies, could close shop uh, in 2020 simply because they are like they can maybe they can survive trade trade war but they cannot survive like double impacts of both both trade war and then the uh, the virus absolutely you mentioned the trade war uh, of course um you know it's the trade deal is is um was signed it feels like months and months ago but it's still only been about three weeks so much has happened in the meantime um, but t- today we're recording on Thursday. We had some some news from from Beijing, which took us a little bit by surprise because in the middle of what is an, a national and quickly becoming an international crisis, um, China announced that it was going to cut some tariffs on the United States. This is, is quite a small measure in the grand scheme of things. It will be to have additional tariffs, which came in in September and December last year. But nonetheless, Zhou Xin, it shows, I guess, that China has one eye on the ticking deadline of February 14th when the terms of the trade deal will be activated. But why do you think that China has chosen the, today, of all days, to implement these uh, these changes? Well, I think the timing is very interesting. I think China is making this uh, announcement in response to the uh, rising voices in Washington or in the international community about you know, whether China can still honor its promises in the phase one deal. And China was announcing it uh, to show a gesture, say, you know, we, we are still doing our part of the job, you know, we are still implementing the phase one deal. And as uh, China said in the statement, you know, the eventual goal is to uh, removing all the uh, punitive uh, additional tariffs imposed since the trade war started in 2018. But that said, uh, you know, this doesn't change the fact that China may find it increasingly difficult to honor its other promises. For instance, the purchase of uh, 200 billion U.S. dollar assets, uh, uh, dollar worth of American goods and services from from the United States, because it's simply become impossible if uh, uh, China's GDP grows uh, drops to two percent or even lower in the first quarter, and if, if the GDP growth rate is dropping to three or four percent in this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, we've reported this week that there is, an, uh, of course, as there is in all of, all of these sorts of trade agreements, 
um, a sort of get out of jail free card. It's it's a you know a, a force majeure clause which dictates that if uh, there's a natural disaster or some other sort of equivalent emergency, then the parties can consult and co- come to some sort of an arrangement which may lessen the uh, the commitments of the trade deal. Um, do you think that maybe Beijing is lining up to to try and come to some sort of an arrangement with the U.S. on that front? Well, that's certainly an option for Beijing. But it is not an urgency uh, for, for Beijing. It is not a uh, priority for, for the Chinese government to say something to, the, to, to Trump that, oh, we, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, fulfill all these uh, pledges. So please uh, make it more flexible. I think it, the, the time is not right. Uh, as the Global Times uh, reporter, report uh, claims, uh, the earliest possible date would be the end of the March when China has some confidence that the uh, the virus situation is under control, or at least the Beijing can see more clearly how big impact uh, this virus will have on the Chinese economy. Then China will have a clear answer to talk to the U.S. side. You know, for, for now, the, the priority is completely, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's overriding priority, pushing everything aside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and even imagine, like, if, if, you know, China tomorrow, say, make a phone call to the United States for the U.S. TR saying, you know, uh, we may have some trouble in uh, uh, making some purchases, and then the, the answer, the uh, the question from the other side would be naturally like uh, by how much, and uh, and the China would would just answer say we have no idea, we have to mm-hmm. uh, wait and see. So what's the difference in just waiting to the the end of March, the earliest date, when China can have a general idea and then renegotiate or rediscuss that with the United States? Excellent point. Um, very much the unknown at the moment. And, and just to finish up, Jusin, um, as I mentioned, we're recording on Thursday. So, you know, Chinese businesses uh, in large parts of the country are supposed to reopen on, on Monday the 10th. Um, how, yeah. how realistic do you think that is? And when will we know whether that's going to, to change? Well, I think for now, um, the priority is to con- uh, control the people's movement to stop the, the uh, spread of the virus. So this is a kind of really big uncertain thing. And some, it is uh, up to the local governments to decide, the local authorities decide. Uh, for instance, some places say, you know, if all your employees are local, if they prove that they're healthy, maybe you can start uh, part of the operation uh, next Monday. But if you need, need, you know, if you have a huge factory and, and people are coming from other parts of the country, maybe you should delay your uh, production date to at least the end of this month. So it really depends. But I don't think, you know, uh, most of the companies or most of the factories can can start normal operation uh, next Monday. I think this is uh, at least like several weeks away. Yeah, agreed. Great stuff, Jushin. Thank you so much and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Finba. Hello, Reno. How are you? Um, is, is the line okay? Because now I got it on Skype on my phone, it might be the best way. I am joined on the line by Renault and Duran. Renault works with companies, foreign companies in particular, manufacturing new products in China and has been doing so for more than a decade. Renault, with the spread of the novel coronavirus through China, we've seen huge swathes of the country's economy on lockdown. Uh, The area responsible for 70% of gross domestic product is shut. Factories are shut, offices are shut, people can't go to work. The same area accounts for 80% of the country's exports. So when you speak with people who are involved in the manufacturing and supply chain business, Renault, what are they telling you about how things have been over the past couple of weeks? Mm, Very stressful, a lot of uncertainty. At this point, right now, as I'm speaking, um, provinces like Guangdong, Zhejiang, and others, which are the the, the main export hubs, um, forced their manufacturing facilities and also pretty much all office work to be off, to be down, as you mentioned. So um, in the meantime, everybody reached out to their suppliers the manufacturers have been hard at work. You know, their human resources managers have been contacting the staff. The big, the main un- uncertainty is the production operators to gauge how many will come back. 
um, and the news are not very good. And the purchasing staff has been in touch with their suppliers of materials and components to get some assurances. You know, when are you going to start? Are you going to operate at full capacity? Can you still honor the, the, the orders that you confirm before the new year? Uh, so at this moment, um, as I said, a lot of uncertainty. People don't commit to anything. Uh, that's on the resources side, right? The, yeah. the, the people and the, the, the materials and components. Yeah. There's another um, source of worries is logistics. And this is actually getting much clearer now as I'm speaking, because when it comes to air shipments, a lot of airlines, a lot of commercial uh, passenger airlines have already suspended their flights, right? Um, and they have a lot of extra capacity that they're re reallocating to other markets. So they are um, planning to, to keep the situation maybe for, for the next few weeks, maybe next few months. Um, and this is cutting a lot of capacity, a lot of shipment capacity out of China mm -hmm. uh, because these passenger airlines were carrying a lot of cargo, uh, a lot of goods. Um, that's, that's, for the, um, that's for air shipments. And also some uh, companies are specialized in air cargo and at least two of them from what I read have um, already announced that they were suspending – their, um, uh, their 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 flights to China. So this this is um, this is a source of a lot of worries and a lot of delays. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. um, let let me just take a, uh, one example, a very painful example. Uh, we have a, a client in the U.S. and they're buying consumer electronics, and they were supposed to have one batch made right after the New Year. Basically, it should have started already this week. And it was set to be sent by air. And there's no way it's going to be sent by air, probably. Okay. 80%, uh, 90% chance that air shipments will not be available. As big companies, you know, the, the car manufacturers, the, the Apples and Microsoft of the world are probably already locking down all the remaining capacity. So that's already four weeks uh, delay is going to be wow. uh, the goods are going to arrive four weeks later just because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and uh, on on top of that, there's production delays probably at least two weeks. So that's already six weeks delays already confirmed. Yeah, and that's already confirmed. That's built in. But I mean, the the uncertainty that you mention um, these when you talk about people who are not able to return, there's so many. Uh, I think it's important to illustrate that there are so many workers who. Um, migrant workers who went back to their hometowns for the Chinese Lunar New Year celebration and who are mm -hmm. trapped there because the towns and cities are locked up. Um, they can't go back to Zhejiang or Guangdong province to work in the factories because they're trapped in their hometowns. So even if, you know, these, these four-week and two-week delays that you mentioned, I guess those are best-case scenario uh, at the moment because we have um, the latest information that we're working on is that factories and you know, cities in China will be back to work on the 10th of February, which is coming Monday. Mm -hmm. But given the fact that the virus is spreading quite rampantly, um, that over the past three days we've had consecutively the most new confirmed deaths due to the virus, it seems to me quite mm -hmm. unlikely that business as usual will be, will be returning to China's manufacturing heartlands anytime soon. Definitely. Uh, I fully agree. So let's break it down. Let's say the office workers, some of them might be trapped in Hubei okay, in, because of the, the lockdown, but might still work on their laptops. Yes. A lot of office workers are going to work on their laptops, whether they go back right away to, to Shenzhen, to Hangzhou and so on, or whether they stay a little bit longer in their hometowns. There's going to be a, there is a lot of fear of taking public transportation, obviously being in close contact with a lot of other people, some of them who might not even have masks, right? Um, when we look at production operators, situation is, is, uh, is very worrisome. Uh, first, those that are in Hubei cannot go back to, the, to, to Guangdong, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Fujian, and so on, which means they cannot be working at all. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of them, are they going to go back to these manufacturing hubs right away? Are they going to stay in their hometown, wait a little bit to see how the situation goes? Nobody knows. This There is no, um, no hard data. There's nothing mm-hmm. uh, that we know about that right now. Yeah. Uh, and because a lot of them are simply waiting and, and, you know, wait and see. Now, manufacturers in Guangdong are expecting uh, a lot of labor shortage in the next four or five months. This will probably also drive the cost of labor, the, mm-hmm. the wages up. Some companies would probably have to offer special bonuses for joining. Um, so a lot of uncertainties and uh, very clear risks. Let's say people are already painting the picture uh, of um, what the situation might be in the next few weeks, actually the next few months. Let's also look at the, the key engineers, the key technicians, or maybe key managers in some of the factories. If they are stuck in Hubei or they decide not to come back, well, some of the processes might not even work at all in the factories. Maybe um, special equipment cannot be programmed, cannot be maintained. So some activities will simply be down. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe some tooling cannot be made because these these um, special technical people are not coming back. They cannot do this on a computer at home. Mm. They need they need to be right there. So there might be a lot of shortages coming from the component manufacturers mm-hmm. affecting the assembly factories and in turn affecting uh, downstream. You know everybody, all all the not just consumer goods but also industrial parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is already happening, by the way. Hyundai, the number five largest car manufacturer in the world, say that their plants in South Korea have to be down because the, the manufacturer of wire harness in China cannot deliver to them. Yes. Well, and, and <laughs> that, that's already having a huge impact. When one car factory is down, it costs them 30 to 40,000 US dollars a minute wow. because – the whole, the whole thing is inactive. It's a huge investment. Um, the, and I also read of another cases with car manuf- uh, French car manufacturer PSA, Peugeot, um, which was starting to threaten one of their Chinese suppliers in Zhejiang that could not deliver a part that they need for making cars in North Africa. And I, uh, this is probably the first case where the Chinese government gave them uh, confirmation or certificate of force majeure, you know, that so that they can invoke that clause in their contract mm-hmm. to avoid penalties for late shipments. The Chinese government is going to help the manufacturers get out of these contracts to avoid heavy penalties. And there's going to be many, many, many other instances of uh, industrial parts not delivered on time, causing the downstream factories to be down. And then in turn, shortage of products on the market absolutely and uh, reno i just want to ask you because everybody um you know for the past few months has been talking about the u.s china trade deal and as we know as part mm-hmm. of the deal china agreed to import an additional 200 billion worth of of um 200 billion dollars worth of american goods what mm-hmm. happens if you're a u.s exporter um, and you want to currently sell goods to China. Is there a way that they can get into the country? Is the logistics network completely down? It's not down. Most of the sea shipments are probably going to operate as usual. Even though I read of a number of measures by a number of countries um, who are worried about the, um, the people who, who, uh, who man the, the, the ships, right? So uh, a lot of measures are getting in, in, in place, but this is... Um, this is appearing slowly, so I can't really comment on, on the impact it might have. I think sea shipments will keep operating mostly. Let's not forget um, the movement of goods has long been imbalanced with full ships and full planes leaving China and half empty ships and half empty planes going into China. So I'm not too worried about logistics. Um, I'm, I'm, I would be more worried of a severe economic crisis um, happening in, in, in China. Well, touch wood, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but I, I can't see how economic growth 
would not be impacted by by such a situation. Yeah, yeah it means lower demand simply, and and maybe payment defaults. Um, companies not able to pay. So I would be very careful about payment terms. Renault, that's been really interesting. Thank you so much for joining us and we speak to you again soon. Great. Thank you, Finbar. Thanks for listening to the US-China Trade War podcast with me, Finbar Birmingham. Please take a moment to like, share, subscribe from whatever platform you're listening. Stay tuned to SEMP.com for more updates on the trade war and more importantly at the moment, the coronavirus. You can also follow us on Twitter at SEMP Economy and I am at F Birmingham. Stay safe and stay healthy.